Hi, I'm Sandra Alvarez of Medievalist.net, and I'm here at To Have and To Hold, um, the conference for pre-modern marriage in Europe. And I'm speaking today with organizer uh, Conrad Eisenbiefle, um, and I just have a couple of questions for him uh, for this series session. Um, I just wanted to know what prompted you to organize a conference on pre-modern marriage. It's a whole series of events that have prompted me. Uh, in Canada, for the last few years, we've had a lot of discussion on what constitutes marriage. And a lot of the discussion has been focused around what is traditional marriage. And the word traditional is a very, very loaded word. It seems to me that what we consider traditional today is not necessarily something that was actually there last year or the year before or 100 years ago or 500 years ago. So the idea of doing a conference on marriage was a little bit uh, an idea to try to figure out what, in fact, was marriage before our current day. Um, since I work in Renaissance and pre-modern and a little bit of medieval, uh, the conference really deals with medieval and Renaissance from 1200, 1250, somewhere around there, to 1650 or 1700. Um, the interesting thing is that when you start looking at marriage in pre-modern Europe, one of, the, one of the things that comes through very clearly is that looking at it from our perspective today, it's like looking at something through two different windows that distance it from us. One of them is the very important window of the Council of Trent. So we're looking at everything from a post-Trinity assumption, from a post-Trinity view, as something that was pre-Trinity. And the Council of Trent was fundamental in changing our perspective our on marriage, our uh, practices of marriage, our rituals of marriage. And we're also looking at early modern marriage through the window of post-Victorian England. So we cannot assume that marriage is, was what it is today. I found those problems in a lot of the documentation I was looking at for my own research where at times I could not figure out when exactly two people got married because there were several dates given and some of them weeks apart, months apart, years apart. And it seems very clear to me at least and I think it came through at the conference today that marriage in pre-modern Europe was a process, not an event. It was a series of events which at the end of the series, at the end of the process, declared that two people were married. But where exactly in that process the actual sacrament of marriage occurs is a little bit unclear. So there's a promise so, made. And there were, there's a promise made between the two families. In the case of Italy, uh, generally speaking, there's a preliminary promise between the two families. Then there's a second promise between the two people involved. Then there is the actual statement of marriage. But then at a later date, but after the statement of marriage in the present tense, oftentimes the wife will go back to her parents' house and she will, at a later date, process in a loud procession with musicians and friends to her husband's house and will be taken in. So the process of marriage can take a lot of time. And what happens is we think of marriage as a one-day event where all those things happen all in one day. That was not the case with the money class and with the nobility. It's a process that took weeks, months, and years. So that is one example of the kind of differences that we need to be aware of and the kind of perspective that we need to open up and not assume that it was a one-day event the way we have it today. We have all those elements today. We do have the promise of marriage, we do have the banquet, we do have the procession, we do have the consummation of uh, the promise in, in, in one day. But that was not back then. So those kind of thoughts led me to think of doing a conference that showed not only the different rituals and assumptions about marriage, but then also the different kinds of marriages. Because as we heard at the conference, there were marriages between the standard marriage between man and woman, but there were also situations, unions, of priests with women, concubinage, which is perhaps the wrong word to use, 
we call it concubinage, but it was like marriage. And uh, as other, the scholar, other scholars have uh, discovered, even in same-sex relationships, oftentimes one of the two same-sex partners is referred to as being kept like a wife. And, uh, and so the whole question of relationship, what constitutes a marriage, what is a de facto uh, relationship, is very interesting. Now, organize the conference to open up the question, not to resolve it. <laughs> so the debate is open. <laughs> um, what, what did you learn? Anything new or intrigued you the most? Or did you enjoy the most in the conference? Every single session was fascinating. It was really stimulating. Um, and every single question, instead of answering anything, opened up more doubt. Mm -hmm. So I think for us scholars, that's good. The more doubt we have, the better the scholarship. Um, and so, uh, to not to close down windows, but to open windows is very, very good. My hope is that the participants, and especially the students who were here from a variety of university courses who were here to attend this, have realized that we need to question further, that we need to not assume that what is today the case was the case yesterday or the day before yesterday. And uh, to be much more careful, as I said earlier, with the word traditional, because there is really no such thing as traditional. The world keeps changing constantly. Um, for next year, do you have a particular date in mind? Yes, we've already set the theme for the conference next year. I don't think it's going to be anywhere near as controversial. <laughs> it's print culture. So a bit of book history, a uh, history of collecting, um, the change from manuscript culture into a print culture. Uh, we're trying to open it up to all sorts of uh, uh, or all sorts of interpretations possible and approaches possible. In fact, one could have a general appro approach to print culture because many of these printers, uh, when they died, their business was taken over by their widows. So we have a lot of publishing houses who, who are vidua and then the name of uh, the deceased husband. So women who are very much involved in print culture is a fascinating topic. So that the aspect of sexuality is still present, even in some things like print right. culture. Okay. Um, and lastly, I wanted to ask, uh, the mix of medieval, pre-modern, and Renaissance papers, why was that important to have that mix? Well, no, in my, just Renaissance or just pre-modern? In my own view, and I think it's shared by many people working on Renaissance scholarship, is that uh, there is a continuum from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. And it's very difficult to tell when one has moved from medieval into Renaissance. Um, so conceivably, within the same year in the same city, some things could be medieval, some things could be Renaissance. So I think the separation is not useful. The term pre-modern may be more useful but it's also an inferior term. So we try to, we use pre-modern, but we included absolutely everybody that we could, mm -hmm. whatever the perspective. And we just used two chronological dates, 1250 or 1200, 1250 to um, 1700, just to clarify. But conceptually, the divides are very blurred. Well, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you.